Thank you, Keith, for that glowing introduction. Stephen, I am. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Keith, for arranging this, and thank you for, to Pastor Tim for the, the hospitality of the pulpit. Uh, lovely to see you all here. Um, special uh, thanks to Mandy for the, for the music, the singing, for leading us so, so well. You uh, certainly play the piano acceptably. <laughs> We have this little joke running, um, but actually, I must say, that, you know, you're all singing your hearts out. So, uh, you know, I think that's just fantastic. It's great when you're up the front, you can hear them all, isn't it? You know, they're all responding. So that's just absolutely marvellous. Um, oh, uh, I'm forgetting to do things. Oh, uh, oh yes, do that. Do this. That's a... No, what? It's technology, though. It's marvellous. We're also live on TikTok. What about that? <laughs> I tell you, the wonders of modern science. Um, so, yeah, so thanks to, to Keith and to, and, and to Tim. And, um, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, in um, uh, uh, Bethel, and um, we know that uh, this you know this land is this land of uh, Stoke and Trent is, is is highly blessed. We know that because it's pouring with rain. Um, <laughs> not that it ever does that in in West Wales, where I'm from. But there we are. So I think the last time I was here, I was speaking about the uh, the EU and uh, the EU's bull, um, and the Tower of Babel, and uh, the EU's woman on the beast. Yeah. The EU's pagan foundation, and, uh, and I think I probably uh, uh, said that uh, unless the Lord keeps the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I, and since then, of course, you've had um, some sort of uh, uh, Brexit, um, and um, you, you're you're laughing. Um, I, I remind you of that that man, um, Steve Bray, the man who was dressed up in blue. You remember him with the big top hat with the EU stars and outside uh, Parliament? He would go, "Stop Brexit!" That, that fella. Uh, and then he was he turned up at the Conservative Party conference, um, and um, the last year, and he was saying, "Brexit isn't going too well, is it?" Well, no, of course it's not, because you, you know this is a little bit like. Um, when President Obama came to power and he wanted to close the Guantanamo Bay concentration camp. And so he held a meeting of all his advisors and said, I want to go on to close this, this, this camp. Very good idea, Mr. President, very good idea. And one of the advisors said, shall I write a policy for you, Mr. President? Yes, thank you, yes, if you could do that. And so a couple of months go by and his policy turns up, you see. And it's like sort of a, a 600 pages of, of it. Um, and because when he goes through it, closing Guantanamo Bay isn't even in it. That, that's how they work. <laughs> that's what they do. So, <coughs> so there we are. Um, that's, uh, and that's why we need to, to, to pray for them um, and pray that if the Lord, Lord will you know, sow repentance in our hearts and if he won't, that he will replace them with men after, after um, his own heart. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about, well, you know, preach the gospel, obviously, and, uh, and also to tell you what Christian voice does, why we do it, and how you can join in and support us. Okay. Um, now, uh, some people ask, the, the, you know, the, the, what would Jesus do? You know, those little wristbands, yeah. you know. And then they, some people said, um, I don't know, whatever, it was an election, who would Jesus vote for? And I'm like, I think the question more is framed or should be framed like, who would the King of Kings have in his cabinet? You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, um, uh, here we are. so the, the, the Bible standard for leaders is in the book of Exodus in chapter 18 and verse 21. These are the words of Jethro, but these are, this is timeless. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, he said to Moses, able men, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, Ooh. hating covetousness. And place them over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So that's your, that's your categories. They have to be able men, such as fear God, men of truth, not absurdity, who hate covetousness, men who are not out for themselves. Uh, yeah. Men, in fact, who, um, who are thinking of their, their, of their neighbor, of their fellow human being. 
Um, there's going to be some leaflets at the back. Um, well, there are. Not they're going to be. There are. They're there. You see. Uh, sorry, sir. Engineer, just to make sure everything's clear. I brought some, brought some leaflets, um, uh, and one of them, I tell you, this is sort of things, sort of things that we do. This, this funny little leaflet here, uh, with um, <coughs> "Reject Death, Choose Life" on it, and pictures of unborn babies in it. Now that's a leaflet that uh, my wife and I and a couple of volunteers handed out to those going in to the United Nations Fund for Population Activities Summit in Nairobi in November 2019. Yes, that was just before lockdown, wasn't it? And uh, because I'm uh, married to a, a, a lady from Kenya, and in fact the Lord has used that to set up a, Ken a Kenya branch of Christian Voice. So uh, in fact our chair chairman was there as well, handing out the leaflets, and uh, it's quite good because they, they, they slightly messed up the, uh, uh, the registration, so it was taking longer than it ever should have done. So, which meant that we had a sort of a captive audience of, of the, those who'd, who, who turned up. And the leaflet is very wordy. I don't think we would do it like that again, but they had plenty of time to read it. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. Um, and uh, it's surprising how many, um, and I'm not being um, racist or funny, but we're in Africa, okay? We're in Nairobi, we're in Kenya, where abortion is illegal. And the United Nations Fund for Population Activities are there campaigning for legalized abortion. Legalized sodomy, a comprehensive sexuality education, legalized prostitution, you name it, whatever Western evil you want to name, they were promoting it in that conference in Nairobi. And they knew we were there. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, and the, the conference was actually funded mainly by the Scandinavians and Ireland. And uh, you have the number of, um, of uh, blonde. Uh, blonde-haired women. We had these under the Scandinavians pitched up at this thing in uh, in their numbers. Um, so there we are. That was uh, that's, that's leafy. I, I think it's great for the, the history of it. You know. Um, now it was talking about the Conservative Party conference, and this is a leaflet it's at the back there um, that we handed out at the Conservative Party conference last year, and it says, "Are you for wisdom or absurdity, for people or elites?" Now, I should just unpack that. Um, if wisdom comes from on high, and you can pray for it, where does stupidity come from? <laughs> it comes from, as they say in the baptism service, from the world, the flesh, or the devil. Um, it doesn't come from on high. And if you have wisdom, uh, then you don't, uh, you don't believe absurdities. You don't believe that a man can be a woman, or that you can teach pornography to children and call it sex education. Or that you can command the whole country to go electric, heat homes electric, travel electric, without putting in the necessary infrastructure. The Lord Jesus asked at one time, which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first to count the cost to see whether he has enough to finish it? And now, 2,000 years later, the answer is revealed. It's His Majesty's government. <laughs> they put in a plan. So they have no plan. They put in a scheme. They don't, they don't know. They're well. They don't know things. <laughs> they, they, they are stupid. I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, "When men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything." Yeah. And it's not just believing in, in anything. So we're oh gosh, I'm telling you about our leaflets: wisdom and absurdity. Um, we oh, yeah, we have have some leaflets about the problem with RSE and. Um, not by chance, that's about um, evolution and versus creation. And then there are a couple of our newsletters. Uh, one was published, we're publishing, it's now it's a roundup of what we do online, this newsletter, so, uh, um, and on the streets. So May 2024 had me outside the, the, the cranny, a little uh, LGBT drop-in centre. Well, actually, it's, it's a community drop-in, but they have the LGBTs and transes going there. So I'm handing out leaflets outside this this. Uh, and we have some, some conversations. I'm not saying they were all good. And then in July 2024, uh, we're asking people to pray without ceasing. And it's got a picture of me there uh, standing outside the Murray Stokes abortion facility in Ealing in, uh, in South London, uh, West London, because in, uh, in, in February last year, the Lord convicted me that as five local authorities in England had these buffer zones around the abortion facilities, that, um, and I said, we're five days in the working week. Don't, don't tell me that's six, sorry. 
point. I know there's six, but there are five in the Monday to Friday, five to six. I could I could actually um, witness against the buffer zones outside each one in turn. And, uh, and the one in Ealing, I happened to turn up with um, with, a, with a Bible verse. I so I stood there with my Bible verse, and it's actually it's Psalm 139 and verse 13, and it says. For thou hast possessed my reins. This is King James Version. Okay, so that's, that means my kidneys, figuratively my insides. Okay, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. And uh, oh, they just had this debate, haven't they, in the states between um, uh, old Trumpy and uh, and the Kamala uh, creature, and um, they've. Uh, uh, and apparently, that it got heated on the on the subject of abortion. And I'm saying all, Trump, all any of the pro-lifers have to do is say to the pro-abortion person, can you tell us just what were you when you were in your mother's womb? Yeah. Yeah. Or if you like, what species of animal were you? Yeah. What part of your mother's body were you? Yeah. Hmm? Every single one of us has been there. Yeah. Every one of us has been in our mother's womb. You know, we might be in our, looking around, uh, we might be in our teens, he said, or we might be in our 20s, or we might be in our 80s, but every single one of us was there in our mother's womb, just as the psalmist says, that was me in my mother's womb. And I just, I love that verse. And uh, how are they going to apply to that to abortion? I'm not quite sure yet, but I have an appeal. I was already been convicted in the magistrate's court, but wait, what do you expect? And I'm now in front of the Crown Court, in, uh, at the end of October, the end of next month, in, um, in was it Twickenham or something, Isleworth, Isleworth Crown Court. So I'm going there before the learned judge, and we shall see what he says. You know, judge, you know, I mean, judges are always learned. Yeah, judges are always learned. Um, <laughs> and the other thing that, that <laughs> even, if, even when they got it wrong, it's still the, 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 the learned judge that might have misdirected himself. So it's, it's an appeal court. It's very funny. Um, another thing we have uh, up there are some um, of these lamplight Bible reading plans. And, um, and so they are, everything's free. So free. You know, you know when those Christian organizations turn up, they have to buy stuff off them. Well, here everything is free. Okay, so uh, lamplight one year Bible reading plan. And, uh, and I was just sort of looking through it. And um, where's my little note on this? Come on, little note. Uh, because uh, I was going to share with you some of the, the text, because some of those are foundational to what we believe, the assumptions that Christian Voice is based on. Uh, the first one is that God is the creator. And then, so that's based on, if you, want, if, you want, if you want to call me upon any of these and ask me to prove them for the Bible, I will. You know I can. Uh, Genesis chapter 21, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Um, and in Psalm 119, it sets out how God has made the earth. And because he's made the earth, he has to put, he's put laws in place uh, to govern it. And, uh, and our Lamplight Bible, it takes you through the Bible, this does. In a year, you go through the Old Testament and the wisdom literature and the New Testament equally through the year. And it's, it's wonderful. So today, for example, I just have to share this with you. Uh, today we have um, uh, I, Isaiah... Uh, chapter, um, well, not very much mistaken, it'll be Isaiah chapter 30, 40, uh, 15, 30, Isaiah chapter 40 and Isaiah chapter 41. So you get two chapters of the Old Testament. You can read the Bible in here, about 20 minutes a day this takes. Um, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, you know this one, say it's my God. Uh, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And you're going, wow, that's John the Baptist, you know. Um, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. What about that, brothers and sisters, eh? What about that? And then the, um, verse 11, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Uh, you know, it's just uh, so good. Did you know that if you're lambing, oh, if the, if the, when, the, when the ewes had her lamb, if you pick that ewe up, uh, pick the lamb up, you're going to pick a ewe up. If you pick the lamb up, well, you can, she's quite heavy. They weigh about eight stone uh, ewes. But you pick the lamb up and the ewe will follow the lamb. 
you will follow them into your landing shed or wherever you want to make them comfortable just for a couple of days. You know, so that's uh, the, the, the work, you can see so much from the you know from the Good Shepherd uh, in, in the Bible, um, and uh, that particular chapter ends. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You know that one. They shall mount up with wheels as with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm not sure why we want to be merciless avian predators, but there we are. Okay. Um, and another verse here, that he bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth with vanity. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's judgment in this chapter, and there's also God's mercy. And that's, that's just typical of the prophet Isaiah. It's just wonderful. But look, here's Matthew, and this is going to be another one of our, of our proof texts. And I uh, alluded to it earlier. I did. I mentioned it. Uh, 30, Matthew 35. Matthew. Ah, no, it's not Matthew. Those are verses. It's Matthew 22. Matthew 22, if you want to turn to this. You see, we believe that God has given all creation laws to live by. Uh, so the laws of God, when, when a lot of people, when they think of the laws of God, they pick out one they don't like. Maybe it's the law against adultery, because that's stopping us having fun or something. Uh, and that's that's what they think. That's what they think the laws of God are. But actually, they think some of the Christians. Well, you may I won't say some Christians. You might think that Jesus Christ on the cross has abolished the law. But if you jump up in the air, you'll find you still come back down again. So clearly, the law of gravity is still in place. And all that you see, the laws aren't just "Thou shalt not steal." Uh, don't bear false witness. They also, the, if you ask a, a, a Jewish boy how many laws, how many of God's laws there are, he won't say 12, he'll say 613. Because when the rabbis go through the Bible, that's the number of verses they come up with. And, uh, and over half of them are to do with the temple and with, with um, uh, ceremonial. So fewer than half are the civil laws and the moral laws which we need to live by. Uh, so when the Apostle Paul speaks of the law of God, what's he thinking about? He's thinking of the whole thing, including the sacrifices, which were done away with. No mistake about this, but the sacrifices, the sacrificial law was done away with, with by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Uh, why could he do that? Because he was our great high priest. When did he become our great high priest? I'm going to suggest to you that the Gospel writer Luke says that when the Lord Jesus was about 30 years of age, he went to the River Jordan to be baptized of John. Now, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And so John said, well, Why are we doing this? And the Lord Jesus said, Well, let's all let all righteousness be done. Now, us Christians think that we invented baptism, but we didn't. It comes from the Jews, it comes from the Hebrews, it comes from the people of Israel. When you read the law, you will find that, uh, uh, that a woman uh, uh, washes after childbirth in the mikveh, in the, in the baptism tub. A new convert to Judaism is washed in the, in the baptism tub, in the mikveh. And crucially, when Aaron and his sons were ordained to the priesthood, they were washed in the mikveh. So now you're getting a clue what's going on. Remember, John the Baptist was from the priestly family. He was possibly next in line to be high priest. I'm just putting that up. His father was definitely a priest and was serving in his priestly office when the, 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 the prophet was conceived. So when the Lord Jesus baptized the Lord, when the Lord, when the uh, when John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus, he's passing the priesthood from the line of Aaron to the line of Melchizedek. Okay, if you know your book of Hebrews, you'll, you'll, you'll remember that Melchizedek is an older priesthood than that of Aaron, without father, without mother, without, you know, with no end of days. So that's, that's what's happened here. And that's why in Hebrews, the writer says, there being a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. He's not talking about, oh, we're going to abolish, um, thou shalt not um, uh, bear false witness. He's talking about the law of the priesthood. Yeah, you see? And every time in, in, in Hebrews where it talks about the law, it's talking about that, that particular law. So there you go. So that's, um, how did I get there? I know. But anyway, um, the, you know, I was talking about the law, wasn't I, and how big it is. Um, when, you know, when our sheep um, conceive, when they lamb, that's the law of God doing that for them. 
you know, when an insect goes into a chrysalis and dissolves away and then comes back imaginably as a butterfly or whatever it is. That's the law of God doing it. It's just, these laws of God are big. And, uh, and of course, all creation has no alternative but to obey them. Are you with me? You're following me. You see where I'm going. But mankind makes this always constantly making decisions whether we're going to obey the laws of God and be blessed. Amen. Or disobey them and be cursed. And that applies to individuals, to families, to churches, <laughs> to businesses, and to nations. You want the blessing? To the obedience. But other that salvation by works. No, it isn't salvation by works. <laughs> salvation is completely different. That's the law of salvation, which is from the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus. No, this is about this is this is this is what God says in Psalm one that the, the man who, who meditates on the Torah and does it is someone who's going to be blessed. His leaf will not wither. Whatever he does will be blessed. So we want that blessing. We want the blessing which comes from obedience. So civil government then is answerable to God. And the last thing I want to say is that, uh, that our assumptions is that every Christian must pray. We are all called to pray. Now, you might say, well, I don't have the gift for evangelism or I don't have the gift for prophecy or I don't have the gift for um, uh, pastoring or whatever. But you're all commanded to pray. And this starts, well, it, it comes from the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our, our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Do you know what? I was reading Isaiah the other day, and here's a verse that jumped out at me. It was, I think, in Isaiah 29. And it, uh, oh, it was, whew. You can read the Bible time and again, and then something jumps out at you, doesn't it? Um, and I think it's, do you know, if it's not 29, it's 25. Uh, well, no, it's 26, actually. 26 and verse 9. With my soul. Have I desired thee in the night? He says, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Whoa, who knew that? I thought you couldn't make people good by passing good laws. But actually, I think when uh, he went to Liverpool to accept his honorary doctorate, Martin Luther King said, that law, uh, um, law might not make uh, people like me, he said, but it might stop them lynching me, and I think that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> you see? So that, and that prayer that we, from the, uh, the Apostle Paul is, I think, I'll prove that he's based on this, but it makes, it makes all sense. Jeremiah 29, the letter he wrote to the captives. Uh, they'd been told by the false prophets that they would all be as one might put it, home for Christmas or something. <clears throat> but Jeremiah said, no, you're going to be there for 70 years. So this is what you've got to do. You have to build houses, you have to dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. This could be a word to us today. Because if anybody, anybody's out there thinking, oh, it's the last days, I, I, I better just sort of hunker down and, you know, and uh, make sure I'm stocked up with baked beans. You, you, no, you have to build and plant and take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. Christians, as Christians, we were just as bad as anybody else. We're not replacing our populations, let alone increasing. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? There's women out there taking these contraceptive Oh, you've got a bit controversial now, Stevie is. I tell you, there's women out there taking contraceptive pills. You know what? Me, I had a headache the other day and I went to the, the paracetamol, took paracetamol tablet. So far as I can make out, and I'm not sure, am I, am I, am I missing something? You take a medicine when you're poorly. Uh, does that make any sense to anybody? Uh, so, what's wrong with the woman that she has to take the contraceptive pill? Oh, she's fertile. Oh, well, since when was that an illness? 
I quite get that. Uh, you'll be um, not surprised to know that the Muslims don't do this. They have as many children. If the Muslim women are having children, they're walking down the street pushing that pushing that pram with another, you know, six toddlers um, trekking around behind them. Don't blame her. She's only doing what her body's meant to do. Come on. It's our fault that we're not doing the same, that we're not increasing. I don't know, some people are told that the, the, the world's going to end because of net zero or, or climate catastrophes. And that's why they're not having children. Bonkers. Say they believe absurdities. So there you are. And he goes on, and seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. What that? Seek the peace of the city, whether I've caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. And we want peace in our lives, we want things to go well for us. So we pray for the city, we pray for the government, um, not because we, you know, we hate a, a abortionists and gays or whatever, but because we want things to go well. If you go down to Cornwall, go to Land's End, and you, you walk along, uh, you'll, see, you'll see little signs that the, that the local authority has put up saying, don't go past this notice, because you'll fall over the cliff. Uh, if they don't put them there, people will complain that the local authority hasn't put up the notices. I fell over the cliff. Well, God's given you the notices. Here they are. And yet we, but we don't want these ones. I don't know, people. I've got to the stage where I don't now understand that, that people, they're all, they're all barking mad. Tell them. They're all bonkers. They do crazy things. No, they don't, they never make a decision rationally, mind you, nor do I. You make always all the decisions from, uh, from marriage to buying a house to buying a car to choosing which letters is in LV. You, you, they're made at an emotional level, your decisions. Come on, you know, be honest. Be honest with yourselves. So every Christian must pray. What are we what are about this? Um, yes, I think uh, what I was going to do was uh, tell you about some of the articles that we put. You see, uh, what, what, we, what we have here really is an organisation of Christian Voice that we... Uh, th there are some times that we do... <coughs> Little things that well, we all do little, but we, we do uh, things on uh, little things on like I do a little thing and everybody prays for me. And there's other times we will publish um, uh, some scandal that's going on and invite you all to write to your members of parliament. So then that's you doing stuff. So that's like Moses praying at the battle of battle with Amalek, you know, Moses praying and all the people are, are, are in the army, okay, and they all do stuff. So that's that's how I prefer it. But, um, but quite often it comes into an Esther situation where you're all praying for me because I'm doing something which is challenging the, the majesty of the state in some way. Um, so, or even just the, uh, um, the spirit of the age. Sort of things that we've done actually down the years. I was looking at this. We, uh, we got all our people to write to Sainsbury's when they were going to put the morning after pill in their stores and they withdrew it. So glory to God. Um, with... Um, um, the West Ham, the mosque, proposed mosque in West Ham. We went down there, we started praying in January 2007. And they said they were going to have it up for the London Olympics, the biggest place of worship in Europe. It's going to be a 60,000 seater or, I don't know, it should be 60,000 mat mosque, that, that one would be. Uh, and they were going to have this up for, for the London Olympics. Uh, and we went down and prayed, and you know, it's never been built. The Lord has said, confusion, confusion, confusion. The Lord even used um, my dear friend Alan Craig of the Christian People's Alliance uh, to stand up as a councillor, get elected as a councillor in Newham. He was the solitary councillor in the opposition. His solitary opposition councillor was Alan. And um, he, he was, um, actually he was called, the, 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 the Labour group, the ruling really Labour group, called him the councillor from hell. Which is rather interesting turn of phrase. <laughs> Anyway, then the next year there were three of them, Christian Beavers' lives, and the, the council was still sort of fairly, fairly um, uh, equable about this uh, proposal for the mega mosque. Then, um, then George Galloway's Respect Party gained three seats, and they were fanatically in favour of the mega mosque, because they're very pro Muslim, they were fanatically in favour of it. Um, it's, it, it's run by a group called Tabliki Jamaat, which is Arabic for group delivering a message, and the message is one of Muslim supremacy and separation. Um, so George came in with his food, he's gone. And because they were in favour of the mega mosque, the ruling Labour group decided they had to be against it. And you're like, Lord, how do you do that? Because that changed everything. And uh, then when they put their, their, their proposals in uh, for planning, that, that was rejected. And, uh, and, the, and the council took action against them to get, to get the land back because they'd outstayed it and they were broken all the covenants and things. Um, this land, by the way, where we meet, we meet on the 
uh, on, 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 on a path called the Greenway. It's actually the Northern Outfall Sewer. Um, it was built by Mr. Basil Jett um, after the great stink of 1868, I think it was, when the House of Commons was stunk out and they decided that they had to, um, uh, that they had to put some um, uh, had to put some sewage in place, and Basil Jett had the, 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 the job of doing it. And on the Greenway, there, there is this place that looks like a cathedral. The Victorians did not build stuff well. It looks like a cathedral. It's called the Abbey Mills Pumping Station. Okay. The nearest station to the site is the Docklands Light Railway, Abbey Road. These names give you a clue as to what was going on there four or five hundred years ago. This whole area was a huge, great monastery. I think it was run by the Cistercians, if I'm not very much mistaken. And then, of course, Henry VIII dissolved it. And, um, and, and not far from that, you get Three Mills Island. Uh, and then where really were Three Mills? They're all run by the monks. Uh, there's a place where, where they were, were making soap um, out, of, out of pork fat. Yeah, soap in these islands was always made from animal fats. They didn't make, use palm oil, they used animal fats. And if you were, uh, you know, ordinary people would use pork fat and slightly posh people would use uh, uh, mutton or, or beef fat. Um, my wife Judy makes actually makes soap from, um, from our leftover beef fat from where we process our, our meat on the farm. Um, so uh, so it's back in the day stuff, you know, I mean, what else do you expect from us? Back in the day stuff. Um, by the way, this, this is a short intermission. Um, there are a couple of pads there on the chairs. You are invited to leave your contact details on the pads. If you pass them around, uh, you buff. If you could just grab that pad from in front of you and uh, pass them around and put your contact details on and we can keep in touch with you. And at the bottom, there's a QR code that goes to our um, fundraising page. And so you can get your phone, you go and you can make a donation right here and now if you sort of appreciate what half of what I'm saying. Um, there we are. So look, um, so, so we do, we're going out, we're do, doing the, the street witness and also um, the witnessing, you're, you're witnessing to leaders. So that was the Salisbury one. Um, the West Ham Mosque I've covered. Um, it, probably, well, I, I think, um, I don't know what order to do them in. <coughs> Sunday Mirror. And they published a blasphemy against the Lord Jesus. They had the Lord Jesus as a fridge magnet and you could hang sort of girly clothes on him. Um, you know? We knew it was Lord Jesus because he had the, the Catholic sort of the Christ in glory crown, you know. Um, and in fact, I was, I'd been um, uh, inundated with emails to me um, saying that the, the blasphemous play called Corpus Christi by Terence McNally was going to be made into a film. We have, only have seven days. Sign this petition. Well, I knew this play and I knew you couldn't make it into a film. And, uh, and it's just, Impossible to do so. So I knew this was false. And, and I sat there at my desk on the Friday and I said, Lord, I, said, I know this is false. I said, but if there's any real blasphemy happens in the UK, Lord, tell me about it because I want to take some action again over it. And the Lord, the angels obviously heard this and said, okay, big boy wants to take some action, does he? Oh, okay. So what I didn't know was that as I was praying that prayer, some guys up in Manchester for the Maranatha community were putting in the post at that moment the details of this blasphemy out of Sunday Mirror as I was praying. So the next day it landed on my desk. It came first class, landed on my desk. I'm like, what? <laughs> Is that an answer to prayer or isn't it? Yeah. So we went down to the, to the um, um, Canary Wharf with a whole lot of people and, um, and some banners and placards and stuff. Um, Against, to, to witness against the Sunday Mirror on a Saturday morning, because that's when they put the paper to bed, that they do on Saturday morning. Uh, so we get up there in front of the Canary Wharf Tower, and we'd only been there two minutes before uh, a guy comes out and says, so, he says, sorry, but you know, this is all private property here. You can't really do it here. Um, he's a, such a nice bloke. I said, well, that's a bit of a pain. Said, Some of these people come from Lincolnshire and that, you know. Um, and I've come all the way from Wales. I said, um, I said, where can we go? He said, well, look, he's down there. By the, you see the, the, the London Transport Canary Wharf Underground Station. Well, that, that bit, just a bit away from it, that's public property. You could do it there. So I was like, thanks ever so much, dude, that's great. So down we went there. So we went, come on, everybody, we can't, we can't upset them up here. Uh, we'll go down there. So we went down there. We got outside the London Transport Canary Wharf Station. We started setting up. And, it, and then um, uh, a Canary Wharf employee, a Transport for London employee, came out. A little guy with um, uh, in, a, in a bright blue suit, 
with a bright blue peaked hat on him. I sort of didn't get a photo of him. He's just wonderful uniform. Um, not one I think will suit me, but there we are. Um, and, and so he said, um, you lot, he said, you, this is private property. And I said, well, we've just been told this is public property. That private property starts there at that line, and we're on the public property bit. No, he said, no, this is London Transport property. I said, oh, well, we're doing a witness here against, you know, against the Sunday Mirror. He said, well, you can't do it here. He said, I, I, must, I must ask you to leave. I said, must you? He said, yes. He said, I must ask you to leave. I said, well, I said, in that case, you've done your duty, haven't you? <laughs> and he, he thought about that for a moment. <laughs> for, for a moment, he didn't compute. Uh, but, but then he was like, you mean you're not leaving? I said, no, we're not leaving. Because I know the police station's about half an hour away. You know. It's going to take half an hour for the coppers to turn up. I'm going to call the police. Well, I said, will you call them? So he called the police. The police turned up after half an hour. And they came out and said, who's in charge? I said, well, I suppose I am. I said, well, I said, well, I said, we've been called because of uh, obstruction outside the tube station. Well, I can see you're not obstructing anything. So Mr. Green said, you just carry on and we'll, we'll just watch them over here. When you when you, when you stop, I said, well, about half past 12. They said, that's fine, that's fine. So they, the police have just well, they stood there. They heard the preaching and everything, and uh, and we and there there we are. And um, I don't know if any of you know George Hargreaves who set up the Christian Party. Lovely Christian brother, and he prayed. He'd read that bit about to blessing your enemies, you see, and so he prayed, Lord, that you will bless the London Underground, bless them. And I said, Amen, but through gritted teeth. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then it got to half past twelve. We just finishing the witness. And the Lord closed the underground station with a security alert. All the people had to be evacuated. And I'm, how do you do that? How do you do that? So that was good fun. We had about, I don't know, about 50 people that came down to, uh, to, to witness. So, you know, you can, can join in with these things. And that, that was fantastic. And then not long after that, the Corpus Christi play itself actually uh, got put on by students up at St Andrews. Yeah, that's where Kate and William went to university. So that got put on up at St Andrews, and uh, and and yeah, it was obvious that we had to go up there and uh, and, and witness against it. So we went up there with uh, more leaflets, and even before we got there, the Lord was moving in power. Uh, the treasurer, uh, a strict Presbyterian of the Art Theatre, where this thing was meant to be put on, he resigned. He resigned. Um, and then um, uh, what would happen was that there was a, a Muslim guy, he was the biggest um, donor to the art theatre, Crawford Art Theatre, um, restaurateur he was. So he came up to us and he said, I've, I've taken my funding out of this. He said, and also he said, while you're here, Mr. Andrews, you come and eat free at my restaurant. Hey, happy days. So, um, you know, I was really, anyway, so we went down, down there and, and did that. And then I was on the phone to my son the evening. I said, uh, you never guess, I wanted to go, I want to get in there and preach the gospel. You wanted during one of these performances. I didn't know how I was going to get in. But, but they've but they given me a free ticket. They've invited me in as their guest. What about that? He said, oh, that's great, that's great. That's great. That's great. So I said, that's, that's, so I'm going to go in there and I'm going, to, I'm going to preach the gospel. He said, you go for it, Dad. You go for it. So, uh, so I've gone in there as their guest. I sat down there and I'm waiting, waiting for, my, uh, for my moment. You know, you wait for the Lord's moment to preach the gospel. I'm waiting for you. I sat there waiting for a moment. My moment doesn't seem to be coming, but I'm still sat there waiting for it. And as I'm waiting for my moment, there's a guy called Tom, a posh boy from uh, uh, the um, uh, home county somewhere, and he suddenly stood up. He said, I protest. And he went to the front, and they practiced this, the cast, because they dimmed the stage lights and brought up the house lights, making this Tom center stage. So he said, I protest the Lord Jesus, not this sinful character we're seeing on the stage. He was a man without sin. He went to the cross to forgive you your sins. And so he's preaching like he's giving the whole gospel. You see, he's giving the gospel. And he's even giving the gospel when the, when the, the, when the um, um, security come on and, and lift him up and carry him out. <laughs> I tell you, repent of your sins. The Lord Jesus has died for you. See, amazing stuff. Ah. And I still hadn't got it. Um, I'm still waiting there, waiting for the moment to preach the gospel. And, um, and so it gets to the end. Um, and uh, I thought, oh, well, you know, I missed my opportunity, but I, I could just talk to the cast. So I went down and talked to these kids, bear in mind, there's a Jesus 12, there's going to be 13 cast members. I don't know if there are any more, but there's certainly 13. And so I started to talk to them. And uh, the girl who was playing St. Andrew, because this, for all you people who know your theatre stuff, this is Brechtian drama. So men can play women's parts, women can play men's parts in Brechtian drama. So she's got a 
part of St Andrew's, and the part of St Andrew in this Corpus Christi is the most foul-mouthed of all the parts. I mean, I'm talking about serious foul-mouthed stuff. Um, and I said, so what came out of your mouth? You know, I said, that was just despicable. That was appalling. Oh, she said, in true, true, true acting style, those weren't my words, she said. I said, so I, I remember I was in, in, in Scotland, and um, uh, I, re I, I remember I was in... I don't know what I've done. But anyway, there we are. Might have to sign it again. Um, so I said, but then those words came out of your mouth, Lassie, I said. And that sort of shook her a bit. Um, I said I would pray for them, and I did for a bit. Then I came out of the place, and, uh, and that was when it dawned on me that the gospel had got preached, had been preached, but the Lord had just found a better man than me to do it. You know? <laughs> Crazy. And then, of course, I was on the phone to my son reporting, and I said, uh, oh, you never guess what happened. He said, no, what happened? I said, well, I said, I didn't get to preach the gospel. The Lord found another guy to do it better, but I did get to speak to the cast. And the phone went quiet. He said, no, he said, that's funny, Dad. He said, because, um, because I, he said, I was out to, for a meal with some people last night, and I told them what you were going to do. I said, but that's, it's not very good speaking to a hostile audience like that. It'd be far better if he, if he could just speak to a small group of people. Have you heard, be careful what you pray? Be careful what you think. The Lord takes those thoughts as prayers. Why Lord, I guess you meant. Are you um, how do you know you <laughs> Don't care what you're doing. <laughs> We're live again on TikTok. So there we are. Corpus Christi. Um, Sunday Mirror, uh, the West Ham Mosque, South Wales Echo, similar thing, they published blasphemy, we went down protesting. In fact, we, we, <laughs> we, we had a church service in the, in, the, in the offices of the South Wales Echo, and they, they were terrified. They didn't know what we were doing. We know what we're doing, holding a church service. But it was outside their experience. And when you do that sort of thing, that, uh, that puts the fear of God in them. Uh, it, it was just dramatic what, what happened there. Scotland, I said, was up there about um, with... Um, uh, a protest, as it were, against uh, LGBT Youth Scotland. Uh, and that's one of the leaflets does that. Um, they are promoting uh, homosexuality and transgenderism to children as young as 12, 13. Um, uh, it's just, it's appalling. And actually, I was able to make a video in uh, Edinburgh's Broughton Street about a man called Ian Dunn. And he was a homosexual activist, mainstream homosexual activist. At his funeral, hundreds, thousands attended, even senior police officers, churchmen attended the funeral of Ian Dunn. He set up the Scottish Homosexual Rights Group in the 1970s, probably, and he started up the, and he also started up the Pedophile Information Exchange in 1973, if I'm not very much mistaken. And, uh, and despite that, he was fated to the skies by, by, by their, um, their, their networks. Um, so we've, uh, there's a link there because uh, he always protested that he was not a paedophile and I'm going to get all technical with you. A paedophile technically is someone who is sexually interested in children below the age of consent. If they're older than that, they're, interested in older, they're a pederast and that fits a lot of those men and it certainly fitted Ian Dunn. Uh, he, would, he got caught, he took a, uh, an action against the Sunday Mail in Scotland when they exposed him as a paedophile. But then he was holding meetings up in his flat, and, uh, and a tape kind of, there's a guy I know who went up, went up there and uh, recorded it all. And the point where Ian Dunn boasted that the youngest boy he was ever involved with was 14, um, scuppered his live and action against the Sunday Mail. So that's the kind of people that we're dealing with. That's the kind of people in LGBTU Scotland. There's, there's one of them now has just been uh, um, charged with, with, a, with a child sex offence. Somebody involved in the um, uh, Educate and Celebrate charity, which goes into schools and, uh, and spreads homosexuality and transgenderism. And the, the leader, um, uh, Ellie, I can't remember the name, doesn't matter. She wants to smash heteronormativity, which is Bible truth. These are the kind of things, brothers and sisters, we're up against. And Ealing, you know, we don't know where that's, where that's going to go. Um, and uh, I mean, you've. 
I put a, a couple of things to, to, together for you. It occurred to me the other day, we, we talk about um, two-tier policing, uh, two-tier justice, two-tier politics. Why is it two-tier? I mean, why is it that, um, you know, just a couple of weeks after a man called David Spring, uh, 61, was convicted of violent disorder, pleading, even advised to plead guilty to it in, in, in a court, and he was given a sentence of 18 months. And from the, from the reports I've seen, all that he did, and this is not something I would do or you would do, but he, 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 he attended a, a protest against immigration in Whitehall. Um, he went up to the police officers and uh, shouted um, loudly in their faces that they were parts of the female anatomy. Um, then he um, uh, he questioned them what, where their where their allegiance was was to whether their allegiance was to the to the British um, state or not, uh, or to Britain or not. And then um, lastly, he asked in colourful South London language, uh, "What dominion does Allah have over the United Kingdom?" I'll leave you to work that one out. Um, it's a little bit like the sons of Sceva in the in the old in, in the in the Acts of the Apostles, when the when the, the, these boys turn up and say. Um, to the demon, um, we, we, we cast you out in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. And the demon says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? And in a South London expletive, and you've got what David Spring said about Allah. You know, so uh, there you go. But he got 18 months. Meanwhile, a Muslim guy up in, I think it's Rotherham, um, who uh, was at a petrol station, took exception to some Pakistani women in a car because they were not dressed according to Islamic dress. Uh, smashed the face of one of them against the steering wheel, punched the other two. Um, it was described by the judge as a, you know, as a violent, violent criminal. Six months suspended. So uh, two-tier two -tier policing, two-tier justice. Why have you got two-tier justice? Why is it that I can go down on the, on the, on the London transport and, and, and see a poster which says, uh, we're cracking down on hate crime? You know, burglary, shoplifting, knife crime are cool with, but we're cracking down on, on hate crime. The reason is that that is an, an idea. That's an, if, you, if you do hate crime, that's against the ideas that the state has put in place. If you go to protest again, against their policies on immigration, you, again, you're attacking the state. But crimes like burglary, shoplifting, knife crime, those are crimes against ordinary people. And ordinary people, I have to tell you, ordinary people do not count. Sadly, in the eyes of the of, of those in the up there, um, I was just going to ask you. Oh yeah, I'm just going to give a few home truths here. Why they're doing it? You think that government ministers, let alone secretaries of state, are highly intelligent people who have got to their positions um, by, by, their, by their intellect and their, and, and their altruism. But they're not. They're people like you. They're just as clever or as dumb as, as you are. And also, there's another thing running through here. If you want to be elected to Parliament, I'm going to suggest to you that there's a greater proportion in the House of Commons than in the general population of people who are ambitious, nothing wrong with ambitious, but they're also ruthless, they're self-advancing, self-promoting, self-centered, self-absorbed, corrupt, and plain narcissistic. So if you're talking about parliamentary reform, you probably ought to start with the House of Commons, clear them out first. I don't know, just a suggestion. Bring back all the hereditary peers and jolly well make them run the country as they're supposed to be doing. I don't know, just an idea. But the thing is, you see, the Lord Jesus said there was a judge in a city who, who loved not God, nor regarded man. If you don't get those commandments in the right order, you, you, you're, you're not going to do it. Again, from our lamplight lamp plan today, Matthew chapter 22. The great commandment, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him to say, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor, thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And that's what they cannot do. <clears throat> they can't love God 
And so, they, well, they don't love God. They refuse to do God. They refuse to honor our Christian constitution. And therefore, they don't love their neighbor either. You know? And you get, uh, you know, you get somebody who becomes prime minister and, uh, you know, and you look at him and it's a, a man without any, any sense of humor and without any self-awareness. Uh, a man who doesn't even know when he's on the wrong side of, of that, that publican who threw him out of his pub during lockdown, if you remember that. He just couldn't, did not compute, did not compute. You know, they don't care about you. I said during the lockdown, when people were dying from the, this, this COVID thing, uh, that uh, the, the, the British state doesn't care whether you live or die. Uh, they, they, might, they, they might pretend that they care, but you, and you might say it's not their job to care, um, but they, they don't care. And when, they, you know, the uh, Home Office Minister, yes, Diana Johnson, we're talking about you, she had her purse stolen when she was at a, at a crime-fighting conference the other day speaking to senior police officers. Yeah, and, um, and then, uh, then, then one of her junior ministers said that, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're definitely going to be, you know, cracking down on, on, on crime, cracking down on street crime. And that's why we've launched some, I don't know, some initiative. So, uh, but it just goes on because they don't actually care about ordinary people because they don't have the love of God in their hearts. That's why we need to pray for them, you know? Because I think actually now what's happening is that um, they legalized all this stuff in the 1960s. They legalized abortion, they legalized, uh, oh, you know, um, stuff, that, unnatural acts, let's say. And, um, and, and then of course trans stuff has come in. But now of course, the UK government isn't just content with legalizing it, they promote it. They promote it to children in schools. They promote it overseas in their overseas aid programs. They go to the British Embassy in Kathmandu. Where's that? Nepal. They've, they're giving grants to LGBT groups in Nepal. <laughs> why? 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 Why are you funding that initiative? You know. Um, so uh, the, the, I'm saying that the last time that that was done, where the state actually promoted evil, was in the days of Lot, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And I've even been looking at the 18th century, and there was drunkenness and debauchery, prostitution. There was even a directory of prostitutes published in the 18th century. Did you know that? I tell you. That was published from 1760 to 1790. Charles Wesley was, uh, John Wesley was preaching, preached against prostitution in, uh, in Covent Garden in London, Seven Dials, um, near the Cambridge Theatre down there. Uh, it, but, um, but nevertheless, it still, still went on. And, um, and, and, but they, the difference was, of course, that the government at that day was not promoting it. And that's the difference today. So we're living in the days of Lot. What are we doing? And if we find ourselves living in the days of Lot, they believe absurdities. Um, I'm going to suggest to you what you do is uh, do the little things. Now, I've come from Wales, as you know, from Saint, uh, the, the actual Anglican Diocese of St. David's. Now, St. David, a man of God, he lived virtually through all of the 6th century, all of the 500s St. David was living through. And um, the Celtic saints were, I don't know, they were, they were moving in the Holy Spirit. St. Columba, you know, him who set up the, the community on, um, on, on Iona, stopped a service. Once well, stopped a communion service, they, were, they started to, you know, remember the dead in the service. He said, oh, we have to add uh, St. Goldman to the list. I've just heard in my spirit that he's just died in Ireland. What is all that about? And then St. David heard in his spirit that a brother was um, in trouble on his way to St. David's. You know, he'd been set upon by, uh, by um, brigands or something on the way to St. David's. Now, St. David is well known as an austere man. Um, he set up his, if you set up a, a monastic community, you have to have a rule. His rule forbade alcohol completely, and they were allowed bread, but they were only allowed meat once a week, and that was fish. I don't know whether it was on Friday or not, but anyway, they were allowed fish once a week. And yet young guys flocked to it. I don't know how he marketed it. You're tough enough for this. I don't know. But anyway, he heard in his spirit that his brother was, on, was in trouble. Now what would we do? We go, oh Lord, will you save him? Save our brother, Lord. Will you save him? Be with him, Lord. Be a tower of strength for him. You know, he's strong tower and, he, and he's, you know, Lord, just protect him. Ah, well, they prayed all that. And then David sent out a band of armed men to help him. That's the kind of people we're talking about. Men of action. And those are the kind of men we need today. And D David, on his deathbed, said this, which is Welsh for do the little things. 
And when you do the little things, I've tested this so many times, you've heard it from my testimony. When you do the little things that only you can do, you can leave it to the Almighty to do what only He can do. And it never fails. It was, I, it was Prophet Isaiah who found himself <laughs> responding to the call, here am I, send me. You know, we pray all these prayers, Lord, do something, Lord, do. We get in our prayer meetings, don't we? We talk about the stuff, and then we go, Lord, do this, Lord, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. When do we ever say, Lord, what can we do? Yeah. yeah. I suggest we ought to start doing that. To search the Lord, seek the Lord for the little things that only we can do. Um, now, I'm just going to go a couple of things in this. The work first is to, um, in these days, you need to safeguard your families. And uh, I, I suspect, you know, we possibly have, um, you know, we have grandparents as well as parents here. Uh, oh, of course, grandparents are also parents. Uh, but uh, let's not forget that. There are also children who are in their mother's womb. But we've got children in school. If your children in school are in, somewhere in your family, you need to make sure that what, what the teachers are teaching them. You need to get into that school and find out what the materials are. And you might find out, you, know, you might get a bit shocked by what the school are, are, are teaching your children. So... That's absolutely essential. Get in there and find out. Protect your families. And, you know, and, and also, I was reading excerpts from a book called uh, Iron John. It's in that figure in a book that I wrote called uh, uh, The Sexual Dead End um, about those people we talked about earlier. Um, and um, it's, Iron John is a book about growing up. And in it, he says that today in the Western society, he says, boys don't grow up properly. He says they don't see what their fathers are doing. They don't bond properly with their fathers. He said, they don't bond properly with their fathers. A woman, a mother, can never satisfy that hunger for the father. You know? So, and today, there was so much divorce around, and then, you know, then a woman looks for a, a surrogate father for, 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 her, for her children. And he can be, you know, he could be a good guy, but he could be low life. You don't know. There are men out there searching for women with children. Do you know? Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah, so uh, that that has to be that clean break with the with the mother. The boy has to do that. Of course, Jewish society does it so well with the bar mitzvah, and we read of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, going up to, to Jerusalem for exactly that. And then they come back; they all come down. Of course, he goes up in the company of the women, and when he comes back, he's supposed to be in the company of the men. But Joseph has forgotten this, so when they meet up, and the mother says, "Well, where's the boy?" Said, well, Joseph probably said, "Well, he's supposed to be with you, with me." Oh, no. So they have to go back to Jerusalem to find him. And then they find him in the temple saying, what? He's saying, did you not know I must be about my father's business? That's what every Jewish boy says when he's gone to his bar mitzvah. Now he's going to be about his father's business, be his father an accountant or a jeweler or a builder or a, you know, whatever he is, whatever the father is, the son will do. Um, I, I, I had a house in um, France a little while ago, um, <laughs> um, in, in more affluent days, and um, I remember the, the, buying it from the, the uh, solicitors, actors, estate agents down there. And it'd be a, a notaire, and like we have the word notary, so that'd be the notaire. And this, and this had a long, wonderful little plaque on his door, um, uh, Le Maître Branger, six, obviously it's false in French, uh, Le Maître Branger, master, master Branger, successor to his father, his grandfather, and his great grandfather. How good is that? That is that is exactly what we should be doing. You know, boys don't see what their what their fathers are doing. So that we have to somehow get that maleness uh, into those young men. There are some men, I tell you, there are some men who they can be 29, 39, 49, and they're still emotionally nine. You know, it has to be done. John Bly did it with, a, with his Wild Men in the Woods project, you know, getting men together to sort of affirm each other. And maybe that's what we should be doing. For, from a Christian point of view, I mean, why are so many Christian men in, in, in those kind of things? You know, if they come into the church there and they are lacking that stuff, we should have programs to, to get alongside them and, and, and bring them through into, you know, into proper manhood. You know what I'm saying? So that, I just said that from a, a little, um, little bit of a side because it's been on my heart a bit about men. Um, yeah, I know lots and lots of stuff for, for women, so don't think I'm discriminating um, or being a you know, or being a misogynist. Um, I'm not. Um, so, lastly, very, very lastly, before I ask you to support us, because we can't do any of this without your help and your support. You need to pray for us and support us. If you're like, ah, oh, Stephen, I can't get out in the streets and do something. No, but you can support us with so much a month or whatever. You know, you can do that. Okay, now this is Mark, 
chapter 11. This is what I'm going to leave you with. Mark chapter 11. Um, and they'd gone from Bethany up to Jerusalem, and the Lord Jesus had cleansed the temple, and on the way there he had cursed a fig tree. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And then he comes back, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up for the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto him, Have faith in God. That's the first takeaway. Second one is the, the, re the repetition of the, of the speaking, the thing. Um, again, you know, husbands and wives, not just be careful what you think, but speak good to each other. Speak what you want to see. Oh, you don't say, gosh, he always does that. You say, hmm, that's out of character. <laughs> yeah. For very nice sales, this is about positive confession. If you don't, if, if you have a, you know, if, if you're a football team and you go out there thinking we're going to lose, I'll tell you this, you're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Remember Bill Beaumont uh, back in the day um, going out to the, against the Welsh in Cardiff when the Welsh were well, we in our ascendancy and there's somebody called out so they were going out, may the best team win, Bill! And he told us, I'm jolly well hope not. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there we are. <clears throat> so, verily I say unto you, says the Lord, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Right. Now, most word faith teachers, when they're teaching on that, they stop there, and then they concentrate on all that, and they unpack it, and you're going to say this, you're going to, you're going to have this, and, stuff, um, and, and this will be your portion, and they, they do all that. I'm not going to stop there, because the second two verses do this. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I want to propose to you that there are fewer people in the society, maybe even in this room, who are being oppressed by mountains in the way, than are being oppressed by unforgiveness. Yeah. If Satan can keep you in the past, he will rob you of your future. The longer you start thinking about those people who have wronged you, the longer they've got a place in your heart. Why let them in there? Get rid of them. And this is not conditional. This isn't, there's isn't another place where if my, if my brother's sinning against me and come and, uh, and ask for forgiveness, yeah, that's Peter. We know that. It's not seven times, 70 times, seven times. We know that. I don't know, number 490 ah, is a Hebrew word for completeness and perfection. So that's, 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 that's more going on here than meets the eye. Um, we're into spiritual dimensions here. But um, so, you, so you need to forgive. I don't care how old you are and how long this grudge has been going on, all this hurt that you've been having, all this trauma. People have been out there when you're preaching the gospel. You're going, oh, how many people are they walking the streets with hurts and traumas? A child has died, you know, uh, uh, they've lost their job, and injustice has happened. All these things, you need to get alongside them. And, I don't know, it's a one thing so many of us grew up as normal as we do, but, um, but I want to suggest to you that there's a, there might just be a rabbinic device going on here as well. The Lord has proposed this thing with his, about the mountains, and they're all standing there going, oh, they're people, don't forget, these are people like us, right? And they're standing there going, I don't think I can say the mountain move, it'll go in the sea, I don't think I have enough faith for that. But then the Lord Jesus said, you might not have enough faith for that, but you have enough for this, to forgive. You can do this. You might not be able to speak to mountains, but you can forgive. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. Just a little takeaway there to uh, um, just, if you have unforgiveness, or if you know somebody who has unforgiveness, just try and sort them out from that. Just from those couple of verses. It's not conditional. The Lord says, this is what you have to do. If you want the Lord to forgive you your sins, you have to forgive them their sins. We pray that, don't we? Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, Wow. I hope I haven't gone on too long, um, but there was uh, quite a bit I wanted to share with you. And, uh... <laughs> if it's midnight, I've missed my train. But um, every blessing on one of you. Look, look um, let's, just, just, let's just pray, shall we? 
Father, these are big things we've been talking about. You know our hearts, Lord. You know that we are but flesh. Uh, you know, you know, and you know the, the size of this, of the, the, of the obstacles that we face, Lord. The, 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 the mountains, the, um, the, uh, the people coming against us, Lord. Uh, you're just spreading this, this, this unrighteousness, this uh, deceit, this evil. And we know they're all publicly funded, have much more money than we do, Lord God. So we have, we, with King Jehoshaphat, we can say we have no power against this vast company that comes against us, but our eyes are on thee. So, Lord, you know, will you do something in our day that, uh, or even show us what we have to do in our, in our day, Lord. And uh, I'll just pray your blessing on, on, uh, on, on Christian voice, Lord, um, at a time when we really need funding. And also, especially, Lord God, I pray your, pray your blessing on Bethel Church and on Pastor Tim and on, uh, and on Keith and on whoever, or Mandy and whoever is involved in leadership, Alex, whoever is involved in leadership, Lord God, here, just pour out your blessing on them, Father God. And, uh, yeah, you know, just increase their coasts as the, uh, as the Old Testament man uh, prayed, Lord, increase their coasts, we pray. Grant us all travelling mercies as we go from here, Lord. We don't take your mercies for granted. And keep us praying for each other, Lord. Keep us speaking good to each other. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.